Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. I have another very special and esteemed guest with me. And the fun, the fun about this one is that we we've never met before. Matt and I have never met. We threw this together today. Uh, Matt, how are you doing? Uh, not too bad. Yeah, a little, little uh, tired, but I have my coffee. So. There you go. That's a very, very important thing to have in this episode specifically. Uh, what time did you get up this morning, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, 4.45 a.m. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I get up usually at 5 o'clock uh, when I have work. I'm actually off today. I'm off on a little staycation, so I didn't get up until probably 6.45, which felt very weird to me. Um, the reason that you get up so early and the reason you have some coffee today is because we have to talk about the word espresso in this episode. And I I don't know a lot of us about... A lot. I don't know a lot about espresso, and I don't even really like it very much. I don't really care for coffee, and I thought, because of all those reasons, I need to have somebody on this episode who is more knowledgeable than me. Now, I don't know if you would consider yourself a coffee or an espresso expert, but I do believe that you know more than I do. What's your history with espresso and just coffee? I've been a... Yeah, uh, I've been a barista uh, more or less full time for the last five years, and uh, so I do a lot of drinking, and I have a lot of practical knowledge of it, and so I've accumulated a good bit, uh, a good bit of uh, information about it over the years. I would nice. say there's, uh, you know, my uh, my knowledge does have. Uh, I, I don't know a ton about, uh, say, the history of espresso, um, and. Uh, you know, I, I uh, hit the wall with uh, some of the technology involved, but I will say that uh, my practical working knowledge of it is pretty good. So Nice. Anything is better than mine. Um, we'll definitely get more into espresso and coffee and all that stuff when we get to the word in this episode. Um, but, you know, just to, just to get to know you a bit better for not only me, but also the audience, uh, who, who is Matt? Where do you come from? What makes Matt, Matt? What, what do we need to know about you? Uh, well, I'm an artist. Uh, I grew up in the south suburbs of Chicago. Um, was a illustration and film major, and now uh, going back to school to make video games. I also like independent comics and zines. Um, and, uh, I, I do love coffee, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I also, uh, spend a lot of time with my dog. Um, I like, uh, nature and being outside. So nice, um, nice. Uh, um, I actually also graduated um, with a film degree. I'm sort of using it. I do mostly shooting and editing uh, as my day job for sort of corporate stuff, but I am uh, really, really hoping to get into the real film world someday, and I'm working on that. Uh, so we, we, we might have to talk a little bit more offline about that sort of stuff. So game design, that's what you, you said you're getting your master's? Yeah, MFA. Uh, that's amazing. MFA in game design. What is it about games, designing games, that you find so interesting and appealing for you? So I think, um, you know, I, I love film. I love the narrative aspect of it. I think uh, on a, just from a creator level, I have a hard time, I, I guess, uh, narrowing it down to exactly what something should be. So I, I realized this, that here's a scene and if I, uh, if I filmed it from this angle versus this angle versus this angle, any one, I could see any one of these being, uh, being successful. And uh, that, it kind of stressed me out. But what I really loved was, was writing that scene and thinking about it. But I realized I was thinking about it more from a, a, a little bit of a removed perspective. And so I kind of want to just put that, put the experience into the, uh, let, let the user or let the player kind of dictate that a little bit more, have them um, put, the, put the onus of uh, living it and the exact way they experience it uh, more, more give, give that to them um, and just kind of uh, create the framework for, for them to experience it. That was kind of my yeah, original, how I, how I got into it. That's really cool. Um, I, I obviously have to ask, have you, 
created or slash designed any games? Are they things that that are out there that people can play? No, uh, not yet. Right now, it's still still learning. Um, yeah. There was the the most interesting one I made uh, was actually kind of word related. Um, it's a uh, you you'd create uh, kind of a Mad Libs poem hmm. um, out of uh, so so it was kind of poking fun of conspiracy theories, and so you'd be given all these random elements on a bulletin board, and you'd have to connect them, um, and the connections were. You know, uh, tenuous at best, a little nonsensical, and uh, the the end result would be a, a Mad Lib style poem that your character would read off extremely seriously, like uh, like Dairy Queen. Dairy Queen is responsible for um, the assassination of Princess Diana, and then it would go through this uh, long string of connections about how uh, oh the uh, co owner of the Heinz Corporation is actually. Um, you know, married to John Kerry, who was a member of the Skull and Bone Society. Who, and uh, uh, but yeah, in that um, there, there was a bit more narrative, kind of outside of that, uh, the bulletin board connections, where the player would wander this kind of infinite um, liminal space. That sounds very uh, <laughs> ridiculous and fun. I love that concept. That's great. Is it so? It's not like out. Is it more just for for you, for fun, or for friends? That was a project. We uh, didn't publish it because we realized we were using um, all these different, we, we just didn't know what would happen using all these uh, celebrities and uh, company names. And right, so right, right. That we just said, this sense. one's for fun. Yeah, fun yeah. experiment, uh, funny to, to look at, but let's not uh, put it anywhere for now. Yeah. Um, are there any games, I mean, there's decades now uh, of games, um, are there any games that really stand out to you that in like your vision, like really what mean, what's, what's special to you that have like a really interesting, unique sort of game design? I'm really into, I, I like thinking about AR games right now. Mm -hmm. um, that's like augmented reality stuff. And so uh, things like Pokemon Go is probably the the poster child for, for AR games. Um, but then things that are maybe not quite um, your typical, maybe maybe not as game-like, um, but an app called Seek, or uh, which is related to iNaturalist. And that's a kind mm -hmm. of a citizen science app where people are going out, um, taking photos of nature and then uploading them and getting um, kind of badges and rewards. But the actual uh, geo geolocation uh, data is being shared and, um, that, that could be used for scientific purposes to like track uh, animal populations and plant species and things like that. Which is really important. I, I'm aware of that app. I haven't ever used it. Um, so yeah, that's obviously not so much game, but that's, yeah, that's more uh, sort of group worldwide human interaction in a way, but also, yeah. W what's the term that I, I can't think of that you maybe even already said it. That's how, how is it uh, that everybody can come in together to access it and use it? Um, c citizen science is the one yeah. that's coming to mind. Yeah. Um, you could say, I'm, I'm looking at our, our list down the line here, you could say that it takes um, an, a, a, a sprit or a, a sprit de corpse. Uh, de corps. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Maybe well I didn't we, say that right, but... <laughs> yeah, that, we'll, we'll definitely get to that. So p p people just hold on to that until we get there. Um, any, I mean, obviously, you know, game design, that's a huge, huge world. Um, how much longer do you have in school for that? Uh, one more year. One week, so, nice. Yeah. Not too bad. And then, like, do you have a dream dr job, a dream game in your head, a dream anything that you wanna that you're that you're shooting for? Uh, so it'd be great to start my own studio um, or a studio with friends, uh, classmates. Um, but uh, if if that doesn't work out, uh, any any job in the industry, I just I love being part of a creative team. Um, so yeah, right now, uh, that's going into my last year here. I'm starting to get a little more practical and trying to think about uh, job prospects and career paths. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Becoming a, a real adult, get, getting that real job yeah. situation. Right, right. <laughs> Well, um, do, before, you know, we'll do this again at the end, but um, until you get that real world job, whatever that ends up being, um, what, where can people find you? What's, what do you want to plug? 
So uh, I've got my website I'm working on, which is mattpark.art. Uh, and then I'm also on Instagram at matt, uh, four underscores, and then park. Matt underscore, 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 park. Yep. Nice. Right. Uh, I, I feel a little simpatico with you also because our last names are very similar. You're park and I'm parks. Just that yes. one letter off. <laughs> I wonder People if there's some relation. Possibly. Are, are you Scottish? Uh, I th- d- more English, but you know, it's. I'm sure it, it's all sort of connected way back then. I mean, my, my I did some ancestry research, and I do know that the the name originally in England was Park, but ha- had an e at the end. Um, ah, prob- probably probably gotcha. the same for you. So yeah, you know, if we go back enough hundreds of years, there's probably a connection there. Yes, probably. Um, yeah, I, uh, people will frequently just add an S to my name uh, or an er. They'll, they'll say Matt Parker. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Um, well, uh, let's see. I thought I had something else and I can't remember it. So uh, website, Instagram, go check out Matt's stuff. Oh, I remember. What, your, your art, your illustration, what, what's, your, what's your style? Or, or what, what do you yes. work in? Um, mostly uh, graphite. Um, do I have anything nearby? Um, I've got a few things on, you know, I just doodle. <laughs> I doodle. I just have like these, a oh, million wow. of these next to me. Um, so yeah, whenever I'm thinking, here's a, uh, a Tom Sellers kind of person. Here's some other, you know, so I don't know who, uh, so yeah, this is... There's more on my my Instagram, but these are just kind of abstract landscapes. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's very yeah. cool. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go check out your Instagram and see those uh, in more more detail up and big. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, art, game design, and whatever other stuff, go check out Matt's work, website, Instagram, and of course, I'll put that information in the show notes. So we have some really really interesting words to talk about today let's get into it uh the first one is pronounced interesting um i think it is pronounced espiegle (laughs) espiegle uh and it is spelled e-s-p-i-e-g-l-e there is an accent on the e in the middle that is up on the left and down on the right espiegle And uh, this word is an adjective from 1816. The synonyms are frolicsome and roguish, which I really love this word now. This is, I think, maybe one of my favorite words. Frolicsome, roguish, just somebody who wants to just go and frolic through the fields and just be independent. Uh, What are your thoughts? Yeah, I just, I love uh, the word frolicsome, too. Uh, I don't (laughs) think uh, that would have uh, immediately come to mind. So, yeah, that's a great word to just have here. (laughs) Yeah, you just need, you just need some frolicking in your life uh, when you are espiegle. Uh, Where, where the hell does this word come from? Well, it's French. Um, It is from, wow, okay, it's from a word which I guess might be also French, oulespiegle. Which and then in parentheses it says till Ulenspiegle, which looks like a name, and it says uh, th- it's a, a peasant prankster. So maybe in early France, um, if there was a peasant who was also playing pranks on the other peasants, or maybe the royalty, I don't know, uh, they would be called an Ulenspiegle uh, because they are roguish and they love to frolic in their pranks. Wow. There was so much more to this first word than I ever would have imagined. Uh, I, I don't know. Do you do you want to be an, an espiegle now? I uh, consider myself somewhat of, uh, you know, at the coffee shop. I'm a, I'm a bit of the office prankster. I like to you know, get a little wild with the, with the espresso, change out the milks, uh, leave the cap off. Oh, really. no. I don't. Uh... <laughs> That's so roguish. Espiegle. I love this word. Uh, okay, well, I think you may have listened to one episode uh, beforehand, um, so you might be aware of this sound effect thing. Do you remember that? I didn't. Uh, I only listened to a bit, so That's I didn't fine. actually get to the sound effect. No worries, no worries. So this is after each word, I like to do a sound effect. And 
uh, it could be related to espresso. It could be anything. What like what's the first sound effect that you can make with your mouth uh, that that oh, comes no. to mind? I'm throwing you into the fire. You, if you can also totally pass if you want. Through uh, through through a Spiegel. No, no, no. So we'll, we'll it'll be a sound effect after each word. So we'll just make it just it's like a transitional. Like we're moving on to the next word. Okay. Um, all right. What, what about a nice, like, uh, almost like wind chime? Like, da -da -da -da. yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Do -do -do -do. Okay. Nice. I love it. It's very, uh, sort of like, oh, we're going into the dream time now. All right. So uh, it's very, very awkward when I throw people, uh, under the bus into the flames <laughs> like that, but you did great. You came up with the sound effect very quickly. And now because we already made the sound effect, we are going to move on to the next word, which is. Oh, it's related. It is espieglerie. Espieglerie. Um, and we just added an R-I-E to the end of the previous word. So, espieglerie is a noun from 1815. This is the quality or state of being roguish or frolicsome. So, when you are described as espiegle, um, you have espieglerie, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's all it is. Anything additional? I mean, I don't. I don't have anything yeah. additional to say about this one. No, I. Um, uh, this is, goes to a game design uh, thing. Um, they call it the magic circle, and so this is kind of um, a state of being where, um, in order for something to be maybe declared a game, um, the the participants have to be in the magic circle. And so, something I like to think about is the state of being, um, the state of being. Uh, you know, playful or frolicsome, and that if uh, almost any circumstance can be that game if uh, all the participants are are uh, you know in enacting that or embodying that. So yeah, so so uh, in a lot of games, you definitely need some espieglerie uh, to, to to be ready to play a game. You need to be frolicsome. You want to play. Uh, that's what games are all about. You need to be roguish. So yeah, I can see that. Um, well, let's see that 1816, 1815. Yep. Those are, those are, those words are a couple of hundred years old now. And I'm going to go ahead and do the sound effect, uh, which will go bring. The next word is espionage. Uh, you can say espionage, espionage. Um, Canadians like to say espionage. Uh, let's see. Espionage espionage some people like to pronounce it that way espionage okay i did not expect espionage to have so many pronunciations uh this word is a noun from 1793 this is the practice of spying or using spies to obtain information about the plans and activities especially of a foreign government or a competing company as in the example industrial espionage um, did this espionage play into your Mad Lib style game at all? Not to, uh, no, but uh, it very, it, it should. Um, and I, I love thinking about corporate espionage. Mm. Um, I just wonder like what the, what the level of seriousness in that is, uh, all the fine details, like how, how those meetings are happening, um, what the information is like, are there double agents involved? <laughs> In yeah, corporations like hey, well, I, it makes me think of Willy Wonka, you know, in the original one from the seventies. Oh, yeah. He's like, "Go get me that gob, everlasting gobstopper." That's definitely some corporate espionage because I I want to steal it and I want to <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the whole movie is basically he's just trying to weed out people who are potentially uh, there just just as uh, corporate spies to get yeah. the secret recipes. Exactly. <laughs> uh, let's see. The etymology is French espionage. Um, is from espionnaire, which means to spy. Uh, I, I don't speak other languages, so apologies for my pronunciation. Um, from espion, which means spy, from Old Italian, spione, which is from spia or spia, which I assume means spy, of Germanic origin, akin to the Old High German spion, <laughs> which means to spy, and there's more at the spy. So it's just all about being a spy. 
Um, do you do you have any uh, ad additional thoughts ab about uh, espionage, spying, Bond, and any of those stuff? I, I the, my first thought with Bond is the uh, the classic classic N sixty four game Goldeneye. Was that is that in your history at all? Ah uh, yes yes one of the early first person shooters. I will say um, if you're playing for the N sixty four though my uh, my favorite first person shooter would be Diddy Kong Racing. Not your first. A little bit of a hot take, uh, but in the multiplayer battle mode, um, Icicle Pyramid, you could get uh, you could uh, get pretty wild with the first-person shooter. Yeah, nice. definitely my yeah. Uh, my I don't N64. remember. I don't remember if I ever played Diddy Kong Racing. I mean, I definitely played some of those Kong games. I'm trying to like. It's been so many years now for me, but yeah, I I always I loved the uh, party games like that. The Diddy Kong Racing is probably like the off-brand Mario Kart. That totally. was maybe a better, maybe a better game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, that's a hot take for sure. Yeah, absolutely. That uh, one's contentious. Uh, yeah, I'll have to uh, look that up. I think my friends have like a uh, emulator, so maybe I can find that, play a little bit of it. Well, my cat is now standing on my lap, so this might be a little bit difficult, but we're just gonna go with it. I'm sorry you're not going to get as much attention as you want. Um, okay, the next word. Can you make the sound effect this time? Perfect. And the hand motion. If you want to watch this on YouTube, you get to see the hand motions. Uh, the next word is esplanade. Or es uh, you can emphasize the first syllable or the last syllable. Or you can say esplanade and emphasize either syllable. Uh, I've always wondered about that, actually. So this is a noun from 1591. This is a level open stretch of paved or grassy ground, but all, uh, especially one designed for walking or driving along a shore. It's, uh, they must be so beautiful. Just We're just having a little walk down the Esplanade. Yeah, this seems like something that like a rich person would casually say that might reveal that they're a rich person. <laughs> yeah. Like if you were uh, just hanging out with them and you didn't know it, uh, they might be like, oh, you, we could uh, we could go eat over there on the Esplanade. And you'd be like, the what? And uh, that would uh, yeah, uncover, uncover them there. Yeah, you definitely learn quite a bit about somebody uh, when they're using this word, especially, I think especially if they say it Esplanade. Because that sounds like yes. a much, yes, yes, much yes. fancier, <laughs> rich way to say that. Yeah, uh, you notice how I preferred to say it, Esplanade. Esplanade. I'm not. I'm gonna go to the Esplanade. All right. Why Getting is this called? It. Go ahead. Uh, le uh, leviosa. <laughs> no, leviosa, not leviosa. Or <laughs> if it's reverse, I don't know. But yeah. Back to, yeah. Um, this word is from Italian. Uh, spianata, which is from the verb spianare, which means to level. So uh, just taking, taking out a building, to, leveling something down f flat. Um, uh, just today, they're, they're taking down, um, well, I mean, you, you work, I, I didn't say it before, Backlot Cafe. Down the street is the, uh, the, the football field. And so they are, they're, they're leveling that right now because they're going to build a new one. Um, I was also down somewhere else where they had like taken out a whole building that had been leveled. Uh, yeah, there's been a lot of that. Um, so what else? This is from the Latin uh, explanare. Hmm. And there's more at the word explain. So I would like them to explain to me how the word explain is connected to the word to level and esplanade. I have no idea. I'm very confused by that. Hmm. Do you have any memories of being on an esplanade or walking on one or anything? No, you got you got me here. How that could be? Um, yeah, that could be related to explain. But yeah, I feel like uh, I've I've been on a, an open stretch of uh, grassy ground before, uh, a field perhaps, or uh... <laughs> yeah, and, and I've never heard them described as a, an esplanade. Um, Along a shore, though, I think that's that's where they Shh. usually are. So yeah, you know, just I'm walking by the beach. It's it's an esplanade. Yeah, I'm picturing like a retaining wall, some kind of uh, yeah, maybe a drop off to the sea or something. So yeah, maybe it's 
uh, particularly. Uh, it has to do with, with that. Like the the, sh- the shore has been uh, the, the there's a barrier of some kind, and then uh, yeah. built up ground inside it. And they probably just had to, because you know, by by the shore, there's probably some like hilly areas, and it's all at an angle, so they had to level it so you can have a, a walking path of some kind. And then yeah, it's gonna drop off. Uh, okay, I'm gonna do the sound effect. Bring. The next word is not a word that I would have expected to see in the dictionary. It's ESPN, all caps. Uh, it's an abbreviation for Entertainment and Sports Programming Network. And I think it's kind of silly that there are television corporation companies here in the dictionary. Um, I see a football thing behind you. Are you a fan of sports ESPN? Oh, all that stuff. That's so funny. No, actually, this is my friend. This is, I guess, another plug. Uh, but my friend mm. Guy uh, has this great short film, um, and this is the poster for it called End Zone. But yeah, I am That's very cool. much. Uh, I used to play some sports, but I can't believe how little I know about sports currently. Um, yeah, it's been. Uh, yeah, I, I uh, know the least I have in my entire life about sports at the moment. But I was e- equally surprised that uh, ESPN was in here. As its own word and not uh, yeah, it's, it's very it's, odd. Um, I, I also feel like I am I am at the least knowledgeable point of my my sports knowledge. I was never a big follower of sports in general, um, but you know, I mean, like when the Bulls were winning, I was definitely in you know junior high and high school. I was following them, but yeah, never never really followed anything too closely. Um, so ESPN has never really been a big part of my life. Um, do you? Is it? a part of your life at all these days or more so when you were younger? More so when I was younger, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I become a bandwagon fan um, yep, yep. from time to time. You know, I, I followed the Blackhawks in 2015, um, but that was the last time I really watched uh, sports, uh, you know, consecutive, regularly or consecutively. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, so sorry, ESPN, uh, I'm not giving you any of my business, but you know, there are plenty of people who do sports is huge, huge business. Um, entertainment and sports programming network. Now, to my knowledge there, while sports are entertainment, they, it's not like ESPN is showing, uh, movies or music or other entertainment. Uh, so it is, a, it's a little odd to me that they have the word entertainment in there. Um, let's see. I, I got nothing else. So can you do, can you do a sound effect, please? <laughs> nice. There's a big break in the, uh, in the chimes there. Yeah. Uh, the next word is espousal or espousal. Uh, this one is a noun from the 14th century. Number one, the synonym is betrothal, which is all about, uh, getting people to marry each other you have been betrothed to somebody so you are required uh to to marry them which i always thought was a odd concept but hey cultures time periods they're they're different than now um one b the synonym is wedding so i guess the actual wedding would be called an espousal this seems very old um Another one, 1C, one the synonym is marriage. So it's like every step of the way, the betrothal before the wedding, the actual wedding, and the marriage, all of those can be called espousal. Uh, so that's, you know, we'll, we'll get into the etymology in a second. Um, number two, a taking up or adopting of a cause or belief. So... This is just, uh, I, this is a new thing. I have a new feeling. Uh, maybe some interaction, some something in my life uh, has made me feel like I want to go, uh, I want to do this espousal so I can uh, help out other people. Um, I know I just chugged through a bunch of stuff. Any thoughts on <laughs> espousal <laughs> for you? Um, I guess just that many, many, at the, at the age I'm at, many of my friends are getting married. So oh, yeah. That's... There's a, a spousal all around me, it seems, which is fun and exciting. Yeah, I get to go yeah. to a lot of weddings. 
That is definitely fun. Yes. Uh, you get to be a part of that before the wedding. You get to be part of the espousal, and then you get to go to the espousal, and then you get to hear about the espousal. That would be the betrothal and the marriage and the, or sorry, the wedding and then the marriage. You get to hear all about that, all stages. Um, well, I would think that that number two definition, taking up adopting of a cause or belief, it's connected to the word spouse. This whole thing is all about the word spouse. Um, it's kind of a weird way. Uh, oh, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm taking up this cause. I'm, I'm bringing this person into my life as a, as a cause. I'm going to help them out. Um, so it's a little bit of a stretch, but I can see it. I can see it. Um, well, the next word is related. It's the word espouse or espouse. Um, and this one is a verb, a transitive verb from the 15th century. So this is the action that's being taken. The first, uh, number one, the synonym is marry. Uh, number two, to take up and support a cause, also become attached to. Um, a synonym is the word adopt, which that to me brings up a lot of like, oh, I'm going to adopt a child or in this case, adopt a cause that I'm going to help out, but also marry. So it, there's a lot going on here. Um, espouser is a noun. And uh, I mean, yeah, it's just, well, looking at the etymology, uh, this is from the lower Latin sponsare, which means to betroth, from the Latin sponsus, which means betrothed. And there's, yes, of course, more at the word spouse. Um, do you, not to dig too deep into your personal life, do you, do you want to espouse someday? Is, is marriage in your, in your future maybe? So, uh, someday, uh, hopefully, um, it seems, seems nice. Uh, yeah, that's something I would, uh, that's definitely something that I'd like to have happen someday. Yeah. Uh, you, you got a lot of other things to focus on first, you know, you, you got school, work, Definitely, I, I definitely recommend focusing on whatever you got going now. And then, you know, if it, if it comes around, then maybe there can be an espousal. Um, okay, sound effect time. We're getting into our big word here. All right. Bling. Nice. We have... Signal. You got to do You got to do it. Um, we have the word espresso. And what I find interesting and frustrating is that it says also... Espresso with an X, and I can't tell you. I mean, you've you've seen it, you've heard it. How many times people like to say espresso? In fact, I remember being at a cafe years ago, and I think their shirts actually said, "There's no X in espresso. It's not espresso. It's espresso." So right off the bat, I'm frustrated by that. I did not realize that that would be in the dictionary. What you've, I'm sure you've experienced this. Yeah, well, so this is kind of a recent uh, you know, rev uh, revelation of mine and some coworkers. Because for for years um, we were uh, you know kind of a little bit uh, pretentious about the whole customers calling it espresso. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, we we'd kind of make fun of that. But then um, down the street is another is another cafe that has that written in the window, and they're more of a French cafe, and so. We were, uh, it, which um, I like our coffee a little bit better, but we, uh, but they, they do a nice job, especially with the pastries. Mm -hmm. um, but we, um, we were talking to somebody from there, and they're like, "Oh yeah, that's actually like the fr like the French will say espresso, and uh, everybody else says espresso." Uh, so I, I don't know how true that was, but yeah. ever since then, I've like, man, I've died. I'm like, uh, I'm doubting everything now. <laughs> we made yeah. fun of that for, we literally made fun of espresso for years. And now it's like, wait, is this legit? And now it's here in the dictionary. But I do see uh, there's maybe uh, we'll get into another part of this definition that I think has changed over time as well. All right. All right. Yeah. This book is a little older. So yeah, I'm sure things have changed. Um, yeah. That's kind of blowing my mind that some people are like, no, no, it's, it's espresso. I still don't, uh, I don't stand by that, but I guess if, if it's in the dictionary, it must be true. So this word is a noun from 1945. Number one is coffee brewed by forcing steam or hot water through finely ground, darkly roasted coffee beans. 
Uh, and then just real quick, number two is just a cup of espresso. Can I have espresso? What's an espresso? It's a cup of espresso. So um, I'm sure you have tons of things that you can say. Let's let's go through this. My first question, of course, is what is the difference between coffee and espresso? So, uh, really, it's just the process that it's made by. Um, so coffee is going to be not really pressurized or it'll just be gravity doing a lot of the work. So you, you call it drip coffee because you'll have coffee that's more coarsely ground and then you just let hot water drip over it and then uh, gravity will, will work its way through and then um, the brewed coffee will come out the bottom. Where espresso, mm -hmm. you're trying to expedite this process. So you have this um, piece of uh, equipment or machinery that's been... Um, you know, d designed and engineered over the past hundred years to make that happen as efficiently and effectively as possible. Um, so that's your, your espresso machine or espresso bar. Um, so, so that's the, the main difference between your, your typical cup of coffee and then espresso, but it's what goes into it is the same. It's just the preparation is a little bit different. So the beans are essentially the same. Um, I mean, I know I've seen like a s specific espresso beans. Do you know what uh, that's about? So that's the part of this definition that I think has changed over time where it says uh, through finely ground, darkly roasted coffee beans, where every cafe I've worked at, um, which most third way cafes, they'll, they'll have a, a medium roast for their espresso. Hmm. Um, they might have a darker roast or a dark medium. But now we're getting into fourth wave coffee. Uh, I feel like the trend is actually to do single origin coffee that's lightly roasted a lot of times. Um, and you're getting these, um, you know, these uh, uh, different variants and um, you know, pretty, pretty diverse tastes and flavor pro profiles from your espresso. And so it's, uh, I find that um, at these nicer coffee shops, it's rarely a darkly darkly roasted coffee bean that they're using for espresso mm. these days. Uh, just just real quick to talk about light, medium, dark. So is this literally when they are roasting the beans beforehand, a light roast would be that's just roasted a little bit, and then medium is longer and dark is longer, and then the, the color is literally more light and medium and dark as well? Right, yeah, basically. Um, and so when you first... The, the coffee bean is originally... It's... Um, it, it comes from, um, it's, there, you have like a cherry on a plant and then the coffee is in the center of the cherry. So once you, um, there's a few different processes for um, getting the bean out of the center of, uh, of that. Um, uh, the typical way is just washing it off. So that's, um, most coffees are a washed coffee. Uh, then you have nat the natural process, which uh, you just let the, the fruit um, fall off on its own. And uh, so it'll keep a lot of those fruity flavors and you might have like a honey process. Um, so that, that's a little different. And then now we're getting into um, even more, uh, even more advanced stuff. You have these, um, this is, these are, this is kind of where my knowledge hits a wall where I'm, uh -huh. I, I need to learn more about these anaerobic, uh, the, uh, all these different processes that are kind of, um, yeah, I'm the cutting edge, I guess. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so, so once you have that, uh, that, that bean, once the cherry is, is off, whichever way you go about it, that those are called greens. And so that's what the, the roaster will either, uh, buy or acquire from the, the, the farm, um, which, you know, are all over the, the world. Um, a lot of times close to the equator at a high altitude. Um, so, you, so Ethiopia is a really popular region. Um, we have, uh, you know, Colombia and uh, places in South America, um, yeah, uh, Indonesia. Uh, you have these green beans, and then you have to decide how how you're going to roast them. And so, yeah, the, the longer it's cooked, basically, the darker the roast. And you'll the, it might also um, you'll start to see kind of an oily film move to the surface of the beans, so they'll start to get kind of shiny and oily looking. Where a lighter roast, uh, do I have some? actually have beans with me <laughs> yeah this is um i don't have a darker roast i don't know how well this 
is coming off on camera, but you could, this is a medium roast, but you could see it's not very oily at all. or kind of um, a little almost chalky looking. Yeah, more like a matte finish. Yes, matte finish. There you go. <laughs> yeah, that would be matte with an E, not Matt the guest. That's important distinction. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, yeah, go ahead. So that's uh, probably the biggest difference in this in this definition and then um some some other more modern things a lot of people or most of the coffee shops i work at if you order an espresso you're going to get a double shot which is two ounces so um if it gets a little bit confusing when people are like i'll take i'll take a shot of, es of espresso it's like okay do you want half of what we would normally make or do you do you just think that what we always give you is a shot of espresso because that's really a double shot. And then if we say double shot, they're like, no, 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 I only bought one. And then it's like, oh no, well, we pull doubles. If you wanted one, we would just dump the other half out. Uh, so, and you'd be paying the same price probably? Yeah, exactly. Because yeah, we'd still we'd still have to toss it or do something with it. Yeah. Um, I remember I, I worked at it as a barista a little bit. I, um, I worked at the movie theater in Evanston and um, they had like a whole uh, bar bistro side and this was years ago and, and I had to make some espresso drinks at a time. So that was when I first learned. And I remember, because uh, I'm just not a coffee fan, I remember when somebody said, I want espresso, just, just the espresso, no latte, no cappuccino. And I was like, it comes in this little tiny cup. What's that about? And it's so strong. So, like, what is the the pressure, that process? What is it about that pressure? It's it's just really concentrated? Is that what it is? Yeah, and I, I will say once you like like once you get into these kind of nicer, nicer coffee beans, it doesn't have to be this bitter, terrible thing. Uh, <laughs> it can almost be this uh nice, sweet, almost fruit juice um taste it's still quintessentially coffee but um but yeah it uh it can be quite nice um i will say though uh people who tell me that about whiskey uh i don't believe them <laughs> i'm like i will never uh, actually enjoy this i don't think and then people are like oh, you just gotta like develop your palate like just drink whiskey for a month I'm like right uh, I'll, I'll pass on the uh <laughs> i'll pass on the uh subtle so uh, descent into alcoholism in order to uh, enjoy this thing that I naturally hate. <laughs> I definitely feel the same way about whiskey. Um, I don't know if there's any amount of whiskey that's going to make me appreciate it. Um, but I, I do feel that way about coffee. I, I've had a number of it, not usually on its own, because it just tastes so bitter to me. I just have never appreciated that. I will say, though, I did work as a barista another time at a cafe, and... Uh, I remember somebody there being really knowledgeable about coffee and having us taste some different kinds. Now, I don't think it was, I don't think we were making espressos out of it. It was more the drip coffee. But I remember her talking about how there's like notes of blueberries in this one kind. And like that kind of blew my mind. I didn't fully, I think, realize or appreciate that coffee could have these sort of flavor notes just like wine does. Um, and so, but it, it sounded like you were sort of getting into that a little bit that like, it doesn't have to have that sort of fully bittery taste. There can be all these other flavors to it. Yeah. Yeah. There, uh, there totally can be. Um, and I'll say it's kind of a, it's a bit of like a barista meme I see now where somebody takes all this, a barista takes all this time to prepare this cup of coffee and they give it to somebody and they're like, so do you taste the, do you taste the strawberries or something? And they're like, oh, it just tastes like coffee. Uh, and it's a, it like breaks your heart. <laughs> um, but it is, a, I, I get it. You know, it's a, maybe an acquired taste. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the, uh, it is so fun to um, have a coffee bean and to try to bring out whatever that flavor is in how you're brewing it. And usually that's, um, you know, a pretty, it can be a pretty delicate process with a lot of small tweaks. And espresso, especially, is uh, a lot more temperamental than other brewing methods. Um, but you can get uh, such um, such a concentrated, potent flavor. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, another coffee brewing method called pour over 
is known for having a really clean cup of coffee, so you could really taste the flavors. Um, espresso, you can you can get that uh, the clarity of flavors as well, but it's almost like they're just um, you know they're amplified. It's the same thing, but it's just stronger. But it does take a lot more finicking. Um, I have this. Uh, yeah, maybe the, this is where the video is kind of nice. But this is my. Got this, this little hand grinder, and um, you know, to to this in, and there's just kind of this little. You could crank this shut, and each one of these notches is a slightly finer or uh, coarser setting for for the espresso, and uh, just one or two notches in either direction, and it'll. You know, it could uh, kind of make or break your espresso. Not completely, but you can, they'll say, oh, this is a little too sour, so it's under extracted, or this is a little too kind of smoky and um, bitter or ashy almost. Uh, so this is, was a little bit ground a little bit too finely, so it was over extracted. Um, and that's kind of, you're, you're working with, um, you're working in fractions of grams um, when you're 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 weighing these things out, and uh, yeah, you know, the slightest difference can can, uh, can really change the cup, change yeah. the espresso. You know, you're a really serious coffee person when you have not only your own grinder but a hand cranked grinder it's not it's not from electricity um I, I i'm aware that you can you know grind grind them either really fine or really coarse and i had no idea that it could affect the flavor so much it almost seems like well why wouldn't there be just one proper uh, way to grind it but it's it's going to be probably dependent on the the beans it's going to be dependent on your taste buds um and I mean, what I want to do is like do a taste test where you have all the different levels of coarseness and see how it changes the flavor. Well, a lot of it's just practicality too. Like um, a French press, for instance, um, that's going to be one of the coarsest grinds that uh, of, of uh, all the brewing methods. Um, and the reason for that is you have um, two, it's uh, two reasons. One, it's uh, full immersion, so. Mm -hmm. You just have uh, the ground coffee sitting completely in the water for, you know, several minutes, you know, three to five minutes, depending on who you talk to. And uh, so be because it's, uh, you know, the, the coarser, the, the finer it is, the more surface area is mm -hmm. on each little piece of coffee. So the, the more the water is going to absorb in, the easier the coffee is going to get extracted. Um, so with a full immersion, you can get away with having these coarser, bigger pieces of coffee. But that has the other practical benefit where if you think about a French press, you have this metal screen and the metal screen isn't as um, fine as like a paper filter. Right. So it's, you, you don't want all these little particles that might slip through the, uh, the, the screen or up around the edges of the screen when you press down. And so, yeah. so the, some of it's just practicality like that. It's all dependent um, on the way that you are going to be using this this coffee. So yeah, coarser for French press. Um, we, my wife makes um, cold brew at home, um, and I know that she likes the espresso beans for that. So uh, I, I haven't delved it, delved into like what how coarse it's supposed to be, but I believe. It's well. Also, there's a mesh in that thing as well. When you put it in the in the container, so you that mesh is also, it's finer than a French press, but it's not as fine as the paper. Um, so that's probably somewhere in the middle. I'm guessing. Yeah, you, you could get away with pretty coarse for if you're letting it steep overnight. Yeah. For instance, you could get away with being pretty coarse on the cold brew, and because uh, it's going to be extracting all night long. So right. Um, uh, another way to like the the coarser the grind is the the cleaner the cup is going to be because um, as you get you uh, get these fine no matter even if you have a great grinder you might get these really fine sediments that are going to seep through one way or another and so uh, just the having the coarser grind eliminates those and so if you um, 
it's kind of balancing um, you want a clean cup, but you don't want it to be weak or uh, under extracted or sour. So mm -hmm. you kind of want to go as coarse as you can without it, um, without, you know, losing that, uh, that oomph. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. It's, it, a lot of that is is very um, very much common sense, and I just never really thought about it. But there's obviously a lot more to it than just that. Um, have you ever been to um, like Europe, for instance, and had their espresso there? And how does it compare to here? No, I, I haven't. Um, yeah, and I, I go I go back and forth between being like, I wonder if like. <laughs> the old school Italian way, I would just be like, Oh, this is terrible. This is uh, just burnt to shit. But, uh, um, right. I, uh, or being like, like, you know, I had my doubts. I thought it was old fashioned, but this is mind blowingly good. And, uh, these dark roasts and, uh, are, are, have these rich flavors that I never really appreciated. Yeah. Um, one way or another, they do have, uh, just the, the workings of the espresso bar, you know, down to some of the, some of these guys, you see them, um, you know, working on four drinks at a time. It's like, it's like, uh, in Howl's moving castle, the, the <laughs> guy in the engine room, you know, they have all these hands, it seems yeah, <laughs> they're yeah. pouring three drinks at once and stuff. So they definitely have that down. And I think the, um, part of that is the culture around coffee and espresso allows for them to make these drinks, that are, it's not a 24 ounce extra foamy drink with all these extra ingredients. It's, it's, you know, a, uh, it, you know, maybe a macchiato with a, a little bit of foam on top. So it's a, you know, a, like a three ounce drink. Yeah. Um, much more simple. Right. So you could whip out, you could just keep making them. And uh, yeah. that's what people have come to expect and uh, what they like. Um, what, what's your drink? What's your favorite espresso drink? So aside from, I, I like uh, a good pour over. That's not espresso, but that's, if you could, it's kind of hard to find a good pour over. Um, then uh, a nice single origin espresso. It's been dialed in. Um, again, you just get all those unique flavors. And it, it's almost like, it's a little magical because I think you, even me, who's been in this for, for a minute and uh, drinks coffee or you know, on my off days, I'll go to, to a coffee shop or two. Even me, it's still, I think I still have it in my head. Like this is supposed to be, this is supposed to be bitter. So when I have it and uh, there is that nice juicy um, experience and there's, uh, you know, these floral notes and all this other stuff happening, it's still, it still feels a little magical or it feels like, oh, how'd you, like they, they, they really hit it. Uh, <laughs> I can't, you know, it's, it's surprising in a way. So yeah, a good shot of espresso, um, just straight up would be my, my second coffee drink. Then I, I also really like a cortado. So that's just a 50, 50 ratio of espresso to milk. So it's mm. kind of like a Spanish, uh, style, um, uh, coffee drink. Um, you get this really nice, there, there's like a chemical bomb that happens with coffee and milk. It's not like the, the fat and the protein and milk um, and the acidity in coffee. Uh, so something happens on a chemical level, um, but I just find that ratio, the 50-50 ratio to give almost this tanginess to it. Um, that, that's uh, really nice. And it's a good way to kind of, um, if you're uh, just trying the espresso, you, uh, this, this uh, you, you can see the barista skills as well. They could pour a little bit of latte art on a cortado. They could. It's a little bit dif uh, difficult to foam it right. It's not very. It's a pretty flat drink. Um, so yeah, I like uh, yeah, the cortado is probably my drink of choice. I would just straight nice. espresso or, or pour over. Yeah, that seems like a good blend. Like straight up espresso feels uh, a lot more maybe European or Spanish, and then uh, you know the, these these lattes and cappuccinos and fancy lots of ingredients drinks they seem a lot more American. Um, but the cortado seems like it's sort of a good balance in between the two, where maybe you still want some of that milk or something, but you still also really love and appreciate the espresso on its own. So yeah, that makes sense uh, why you would like that one. I mean, for me. 
you know, I like sweet. I don't care for bitter. So that's why I lean towards like <laughs> the things that even more American. It's, so like a dirty chai or something with all those sweeteners and stuff. Not, not the way that espresso <laughs> br- drink should be made. Um, but you know, that's that's what no, makes I like the world going one more. like. Have you ever had a Dunkachino? <laughs> Uh, uh, is it like a frappuccino at dunkin donuts it's i I wouldn't say a frapp it's like uh if you're in a gas station that has like the pre-made uh flavored like latte machine it's like if you just took all the flavors and (laughs) held it down (laughs) it's like like a a suicide yeah 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 but with the latte machine (laughs) at a gas station and uh, that's those it's delicious but it tastes like melted plastic too but uh in a in a really uh addicting way <laughs> yeah throw <laughs> so, some sugar so, yeah. in there and i'm sure i'll like it <laughs> nice well um i i have really appreciated this education we obviously have some more words um that we got to get through but um yeah I, I, and i know that i could talk to you about espresso for a long time and neither one of us has time for that but maybe maybe another day um i'll yeah. come into the cafe i mean that's our local cafe and so i'll come in and if if you're there maybe i'll uh maybe i'll try uh, some some special espresso drink from you just yeah, just to educate yeah. myself more yeah if we don't have the uh i usually have my hand grinder on me so if i yeah. if we don't have uh if uh yeah if we have some time i could uh grind up not the not the house blend which is good it's solid but yeah something a little a little nicer maybe awesome i'll have to go when it's slow although i don't think it's ever slow there it's rare but <laughs> yeah um okay we we didn't talk about the etymology um this is from italian cafe espresso uh, the cafe is in parentheses which is probably, oh my God, this is the longest, the longest English translation I think I've ever seen in the etymology. Cafe espresso in Italian probably is literally coffee made on the spot at the customer's request. And how that became cafe espresso, I have no idea. Have you, do you have any knowledge of uh, the Italian word of this? Uh, this is crazy. Oh. No, I don't. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, going to very like dumb Americanism. I'm like uh, pressed, like presso, because the pressure. Right, right. Maybe yeah, that makes I'm, sense. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, the book th- doesn't even know, and they do their research, so they they don't even know um, what exactly. Like history doesn't even know exactly where this word came from. So that's a fascinating etymology. Coffee made on the spot at the customer's request. Here, I want this drink. Here's a cafe espresso, and, and then it just became espresso, and it is now turning into espresso, which pisses me off. <laughs> um, okay. Time for a sound effect. The next word is esprit, uh, and it is spelled E-S-P-R-I-T because it is French. Noun from 1573, number one is vivacious cleverness or wit, esprit. And then number two, the synonym is esprit de corps, which is our next word. But I just love that definition, vivacious cleverness or wit. Do you think that you have this esprit? I don't. Sometimes. (laughs) If I'm on, but uh, I would say that's uh, if I'm in rare form, so usually no. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Same for me. Maybe if uh, if I'm, you know, sometimes you get that spark of something and then maybe, but yeah, I do not regularly have esprit. Um, this word is from the Latin spiritus, which means spirit. So yeah, that makes sense. Well, we, we obviously have to get to the next word because it's related. Uh, can you please make the sound effect? The next one is esprit de corps. And this is three words. Esprit is the first word. The second word is D-E. The third word is C-O-R-P-S. Lots of extra letters here that do not get pronounced. Uh, Noun from 1780. This is the common spirit existing in the members of a group and inspiring enthusiasm, devotion, and strong regard for the honor of the group. And I mean, I've heard of this phrase, but I never really knew what it meant. 
Um, this was the one that you had mentioned earlier. Um, can you remind us of the context for that? Yeah, I forget what <laughs> why I brought <laughs> it up. Uh, yeah, I definitely mispronounced it. Yeah, esprit de corps. Uh, esprit de corps. I, I like American. this one. Uh, it's basically it's just vibes, basically. Good vibes. vibes. Yeah. yeah, vibes is the more uh, the maybe the uh, popular phrase these days. Totally, but, uh, totally. The common spirit existing in the members of a group and inspiring enthusiasm, devotion, and strong regard for the honor of the group. Yeah, I feel like you could really dig into that one a lot. I don't know. If I find some additional information, um, I'll put a link in the show notes for this one. But yeah, it's like, because core, I think, is about the body, but it's also sort of like, um, you know, there's like drum and bugle cores, and that's a group of people. It's all about, I think, the people and stuff. And so, yeah, it's the spirit of the group, which is really cool. Hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do you have anything else about esprit de corps? No, no. Um, yeah. All right. Moving on to. Do, 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 do. Wow, this uh, this wind chime has really changed a lot. Um, <laughs> the next word is uh, espy. E S P Y. This is a transitive verb from the 14th century, and it is to catch sight of. Um, as in the example. Among the several horses, she espied the white Mustang. And that is a quote from Zane Gray. So it's literally just seen a thing. I espy with my little eye. <laughs> nice. uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know where else to go with that. I, I, see, I see somebody on my computer screen. Espy. Um, yeah, there's just more at the word spy. Is this a word that you have ever said in your life? Not with the the e in front. Yeah, that's that's a a little new to me there. A spy. I guess that's like the active. I don't know. That yeah. A... It definitely seems like um, it's it's a more old way to say I'm I see something. I have caught sight of a thing. Um, a spy. Yeah. Not not something that we use in our modern culture. I don't think. Um, okay, I think it's your turn for the sound effect. The next word is ESQ or ESQR. Both have a capital E. It's an abbreviation for the word Esquire. Uh, and of course, I can't hear that word and not think of Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. Um, I don't know if that's something that you've seen, but they're like... A long time ago? Yeah, yeah. But yeah it's I like, don't know the... They, they put in Esquire know. at the end of their names for some reason. Um, we're going to get to that word later this episode, but we got a couple to talk about before that. So I'm going to go. The next word is the a suffix, esque, E-S-Q-U-E. Maybe one of my favorite suffixes. It's an adjective suffix, and it means in the manner or style of. Um, also just like. Oh, it's like that thing. Um, as in the example, statuesque. So if you are standing there, all all pretty, all buff, all solid marble, then you would be statuesque. Um, let's look at the etymology real quick. Um, from the Italian esco, Germanic origin, Old High German, ish. It's related to ish, which is another way to say like, oh, it's like that thing. It's it's statuish. We don't say statuish. We sh we say statuesque. So I wonder, like, when do you use one or the other? I don't know. Do you do you like this one? I I love this one. I find myself using this and ish uh, all the time, and also um, slashes. I, I wonder if this is. Uh, I attribute this maybe to like a very uh, particular um, individual. To me, uh, internet brain rot, case of internet brain rot, where uh, I just can't focus enough to use uh, the exact word that I want. So instead, I find myself using three, two to three words and just putting a slash between them and saying, kind of like this word, kind of like this word, kind of like this word, or adding ishes and asks to the end of all of them because I don't uh, 
uh, have the attention span to narrow it down to one. <laughs> right, right. I can't think of the right word. I'm going to thesaurusize this. I'm going to give you a bunch of other words that it's kind of like. Uh, and yeah, I also really love to add ish or esque to the end of, of a word that I'm trying to describe. Oh, it's it's like this. It's And of course, I can't ever think of, it, of an example off the top of my head. I'm looking around. I'm like, it's air conditioner-esque. <laughs> it's like a thing that's going to cool your room. So it's air conditioner-esque. I don't know. It, I just love to add add these suffixes to things that just don't make any sense at all. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, something, what would be something that's espresso-esque? It's like espresso, but not quite. I don't know. Can't think of what. Ooh. Ish. Yeah, me neither. So yeah. all the stuff I think of just has espresso in it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, okay, what's the next word? First, let's hear a sound effect from Matt. <laughs> The next word is, well, it looks like it's pronounced Eskimo. The first syllable is emphasized, Eskimo. Um, and yes, you would, you would, it sounds like Eskimo. It's not spelled like Eskimo. It's capital E-S-Q-U-I-M-A-U. Um, and this is a noun from 1744. And of course, the synonym is just Eskimo. So this uh it's just a more more frenchy way i guess to spell eskimo um it's from an algonquin language which is um montane and that's just their word so i don't remember um actually eskimo is only it was only a few episodes ago it was um 1584 and so this one this more frenchy spelling um is from a couple of hundred years later and it, I guess it just didn't, uh, it just didn't click with the rest of the world. Maybe in uh, wherever that language is spoken, um, maybe they still use that spelling. I don't know. Do you? No, I've have... never seen. No, I've never yeah. seen the spelling before. So I, I yeah. thought uh, I wasn't expecting after all that for it to to just be what we all know as Eskimo. Yeah. Uh, um, so and yeah. I spoke a bit about Eskimo a couple of episodes ago. Um, I think Inuit is maybe a more proper word these days for Eskimo. Um, but yeah, I'm glad to know that there's just another spelling. Not ever going to use it, but good to know that it exists. Okay. Do, 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 do. The next word is Esquire. So we are all going to get to learn about what is Esquire. Noun from the 15th century, number one, a member of the English gentry ranking below a knight. Um, so I don't know what else is in that list of things, but below a knight would be an esquire. Um, I think I've heard of a valet or valet. Uh, I think that would be another one that they, I, I feel like Game of Thrones taught me that. Oh yeah. Speaking of Game of Thrones, you've got uh, good old uh, Podrick. Yes. Yeah, Brienne of Tarth. I guess that's just squire. That's not a squire. But uh, just, I, squire. I'm sure they're very related. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. like spy uh, and a spy. Yeah, the uh, Game of Thrones universe's version of Samwise Gamgee. Maybe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I was going to make a comment, but because this is a little family friendly, I'm going to going to not make that comment about Podrick because I, I think I think I remember the character that you're talking about. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, he was also the first one that I thought of when I thought of Esquire in terms of Game of Thrones. He was like, I'm going to help you. I'm going to, you know, help you put your uh, put your knight gear on and get you your sword yes, and get sir. you your horse and all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, number two for Esquire is a candidate for knighthood serving as shield bearer and attendant to a knight. So, yep, that's exactly what he was doing. Uh, number three, this is just used as a title of courtesy, usually placed in its abbreviated form after the surname, like John R. Smith Esquire, but it doesn't give a definition of what it means. It's just a title of courtesy? What, I, what, what, is, what does that even mean? <laughs> I, I don't know. Hmm. Um, and then number four, this one's archaic, and it is a landed proprietor. So I guess it's somebody who just owns land. I feel like I've also heard Esquire used to describe a lawyer, uh, but I don't know. Do you have any knowledge about what any of this means? No, just like medieval 
just just the medieval version of it. Yeah, all these other the landed proprietor. I guess the um, used as a title of court courtesy kind of makes sense. Like just that the knight would have something to call the person with them that wasn't just like th to give them some some kind of elevated position in their in their travels. Yeah, yeah, that <laughs> but, makes sense. Uh, yeah, I can't think. But the a landed proprietor that's that's an interesting one that I don't yeah. have reference to. Well, I mean, what you said definitely makes sense. Like, oh, I'm not going to just say, hey, you, or say your name. I'm going to give you a, a level of courtesy. I'm going to, it, it makes you feel more important when you have a title after your name, even if it just means you're the one who's bearing my shield. But these days, I feel like it should have some, I don't know, if I, if I ever like, um, uh, signing up for something online or whatever it is, and they're like, what do you want your title to be? I think I might put Esquire because it just it doesn't seem like it means anything. Uh, let's see. The etymology says, this is from this, the word squire, uh, from the Latin, oh, okay, the Latin word scutum, which means shield. So that's actually just where this comes from. And then, yeah, Old Irish, skiaf, which means shield. So it's the one who has the shield, who holds onto the shield, uh, I guess, ready to give it to the knight. They're the Esquire. Hmm. I wasn't expecting that. Anything else from you for Esquire? Should we move on? Uh, I think we should, should move on here. Should move on. We got two more words. Uh, can you please make the sound effect? Do 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 do. The, this word is just the word S, E-S-S, -S, noun from 1540. Number one, the letter S. Number two, something resembling the letter S in shape, uh, especially an S-shaped curve in a road. Oh, we got an S road. You got to go left and then you got to go right. And that's that's it. Um, I mean, my, my only... Uh, connection to this one is my name starts with an S, and so I love the letter S, but uh, S is S. That's it. I feel like the um, the the pronunciation. Uh, what, what do you call like the pronunciation hint afterwards? It, this is just a, the pronunciation hint for the letter S, and so it should also it should say S and then S and then S. <laughs> yeah, S, but... just, just a bunch of S's. Be an be an essie. Um, okay. Uh, we have s as a suffix this time. Noun suffix. Um, uh, this one means female, as in giantess. Um, and of course, we we have all these very genderized words in English. And uh, I mean, I have said this many times. It doesn't feel like we necessarily need these genderized words. Actress would be another one that jumps to my mind, um, but you know we're I think we're slowly getting away from these unless you identify unless you want this word to describe you uh, in whatever way that is that's fine. But usually, if you see s at the end of something, it means the female version of that thing. In this case, a giant, a giant s. Um, yeah, I, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I also feel like. Most of it's just unnecessary these days. But I also I like the um, the new the new words that maybe uh, just just skip the question altogether. So instead of waiter versus waitress, you just have a server. Yeah. Um, so so that kind of uh, evolution is interesting to think about. And then back right. to uh, my job, I was talking to uh, <laughs> this kind of broy guy playing a video game. I was like, oh, I'm a barista. He's like, but aren't you aren't you a dude? Because he thought the the uh at the end meant that it was like feminine. Uh, right. And I was like, he was like, wouldn't it be a barrister? Like a barrister is a lawyer, and uh, <laughs> so uh, that's that was kind of an interesting uh, language thing. That uh, oh, yeah. I'm not sure where he was from, but uh, I guess not, you know when uh, you're, when you're talking about Spanish, you got barista. The a like you said means feminine. So I guess the other version would be baristo. <laughs> which I guess you could go. say. Um, and that makes me think of Barist Bro, 
which is <laughs> just a very fun play on words. And I don't think we should actually use it in any real way. But I do ha- now have a vision of this guy being a barista himself. And so he would definitely be a barista bro. Barista bro. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Throwing some um, monster energy drink into the espresso drinks. Oh, man. Oh, God, that uh, sounds disgusting. Yeah, the definitely uh, the less of these, the less of the S here, the better, probably. Yeah, yeah, we don't need so many genderized things, I think. Okay, we got one more word for this episode. Can you please make a sound effect? The last word is essay, first form. Uh, this is a transitive verb from the 14th century. Number one, to put to a test. Number two, to make an often tentative or experimental (laughs) effort to perform. Uh, The synonym is try. Um, Another synonym for the whole thing is the word attempt. So if you're just trying out, attempting, oh, I'm going to make a test. Um, Is there any time that you have in your job as a barista bro... Uh, have you ever had to try and test something out? Have you experimented or like created a drink? Oh, well, like every day we, we call it dialing in the espresso. And so that's making those small adjustments on the grinder to be mm. coarser or finer to try to get it to hit a certain um, either taste or uh, some parameters on the machine. So there's definitely some trial and error there. Um but then, uh, yeah, I, th- I think with ratios, um, I made like an extremely rich drink uh, with honey. It was like four shots of espresso, a ton of honey, and then uh, some steamed half and half. Mm. And um, it was uh, delicious, but in a very small quantity. But yeah, very, very rich and uh, quite good. But yeah, not the kind of thing you could drink a, a whole cup of. Uh. Yeah, when you when you put the half and half in there, you definitely gotta bring that cup real small, so you're not yes. overdoing it. You don't want twenty ounces of that. No. Uh, let's see. Essayer is a noun, and uh, there's no etymology because I think it's in the next episode. So. Um, we get to now pick a word of the episode, and by we, of course, I mean you. So I'm going to quickly reread them uh, to remind you. I know you have the list there. We had espiegle, espieglerie, espionage, esplanade, ESPN, espousal, espouse, espresso, esprit, esprit de corps, espy, esk, esk, Eskimo, esquire, s, s, and essay. Now, I don't like to guess what my guests are going to pick as the word of the episode because they have surprised me on many occasions. So what do you like? What What's your favorite? Ooh, gosh, it's so close. I'm between uh, Ask and a- actually uh, Espiegle. Uh, okay. The, yeah, the first two, one, es- I love Espiegle? The Espiegle, yeah. Um, Gosh, I'm bad at pronouncing things. I just love frolicsome. I love that as a as a descriptor. Um, of course, uh, espresso too. I, I love espresso. But yeah, no, let's go with. Uh, yeah, let's go. <laughs> you don't have to say it again if you don't want to. <laughs> yeah, let's go with that one. Let's go the first with the word. One. Uh, yeah. es- espiegle. Uh, Spiegel. yeah, that's a, that's a good word. Frolicsome roguish. I'm very grateful to have learned this word because I had no clue that it existed. And I really, really want to meet somebody and be like, wow, you're so, you're so frolicsome. You know what you are? You are, you're espig, es- <laughs> it's a really hard word to say in English. Espiegle, espiegle, espiegle. That's it. Espiegle, I think. Um, so uh, I like to sing little songs uh, with the word of the episode, and it's just something stupid, just like, Espiegle is frolicsome and roguish, and, and that's the end of my song. If you would like to sing a song for this word, feel free, but I also feel like you might say no. Yeah, I'm going to have a hard pass on that. I'm going yeah. to sing on the song here. <laughs> Not a problem at all. Um, th- that's the end of this episode. Uh, it was really, really, really good to meet you. I feel like we have um, probably many other things that we could talk about, like movies, for instance. 
Um, but um, we can save that for another time. Go ahead. What What do you have to plug? Um, what What's What's just some big stuff in your life? Yeah. Again, uh, my name is Matt Park. Uh, so you can find me on Instagram at Matt uh, four underscores Park. Uh, it's, it's Matt underscore 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 Park, and then mattpark.art.com, um, where the landing page is going to be um, kind of a a group poem where anybody can contribute. Uh, oh, so we're definitely word related. Um, That's a bit of cool. a, yeah. So that's kind of uh, my main things going on right now. So the website is mattpark.art.com. Just dot .art. Matt oh, dot .art. .art. Okay. I thought yeah. I heard a .com in there too, but that's okay. So yeah, dot .art, it's just one of the new um, uh, website suffixes that exist now. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Well, I'm definitely going to go check out your work and I'm going to follow you on Instagram. And uh, again, really great to meet you. On, um, uh, there's a good chance I will see you in person one of these days because you work just right down the street. Yeah, that'd be um, great. And uh, good luck with, with your last year of getting your MFA in game design. That sounds really fascinating. Um, and I want to I wanna know what, uh, what comes from that. So yes. uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, we, we made this happen last minute all today. Um, I'm really glad. And I'm really also glad to have learned so much about espresso. And until next time, this has been Spencer dispensing the espresso information. Goodbye.